you're all still here. Wow. Hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Gribbitz. I teach at Princeton in the Near Eastern Studies Department and in the program in Judaic Studies, and I am honored. I am honored to serve as the chair of this well-behaved <laughs> scene. <laughs> I mean symposium. Nice to see you. Uh, thank you, Gav, for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, this is the panel, as opposed to all of the other ones, which are entirely about history, making no reference to the present or the future, this one is about the future. It's called Zionism's Future Whither Israel Diaspora Relations. And we have quite a panel for you. Um, because we have five uh, members, including myself, I guess four uh, panelists, uh, we were given extra time, so just um, hold your booze until an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and then, um, so we're going to be here for an hour and 15 minutes, and we're going to start um, with Dove Waxman. Dove Waxman is the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Professor of Israel Studies and the director of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA. He's the author of four books, uh, The Pursuit of Peace and the Crisis of Israeli Identity, I think this is still the same title, Defending, Defining the Nation, then Israel's Palestinians, The Conflict Within, Trouble in the Tribe, The American Jewish Conflict Over Israel, and most recently, The Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, What Everyone Needs to Know. And I will we'll begin with Professor Waxman, and then I will introduce the next speakers as we go along, because four is just too many to remember. Jonathan, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've really enjoyed listening to all of the presentations so far, and uh, hopefully we can uh, sum up everything uh, and uh, engage in uh, some lively discussions with you all. I want to commend you all for being here throughout the day as well. Um, so, I'm not sure if my document... It no? is now. Uh, it is now up. Okay, so uh, the text that I selected is one that might be familiar to many of you. This was a uh, article published by Peter Beinert in the New York Review of Books back in 2010. Um, it was something of a sensation at its time. Uh, Peter Beinert was at that time a prominent, one of the perhaps the most prominent uh, liberal Zionists. He's somewhat moved away from that position since then. Uh, but this was a really um, important article um, it provoked uh, a firestorm of controversy within the organized Jewish community and beyond, uh, a lot of debate, and I think in many ways um, it set the tone for uh, discussion in the years to come. And I want to unpack uh, three, um, three of the kind of core claims that Bynup makes in this article and consider whether they stand not only the test of time, but as I will suggest that they are at least, if not accurate back then, prescient about the situation today and going forwards. Um, so the first claim he made is that uh, young American Jews, specifically young non-Orthodox American Jews, are um, disassociating themselves, or in the language of Jewish sociologists, distancing themselves from Israel. That was, the, um, that, would be, he, that was an intervention in a long-standing debate among sociologists over the uh, attachment of young American Jews to Israel. So that was the first claim. The second claim he made is that the reason for this distancing from Israel um, was because of the contradiction between their liberal values and political views and Israeli government policies. Right, that there was a contradiction and that this contradiction was driving them away from support for Israel and uh, support for Zionism. And the third claim was that the American Jewish establishment was abetting this process uh, through its silence, through its failure to speak out, through its failure to denounce uh, Israeli government uh, actions and policies that violated uh, American Jewish values and beliefs, specifically liberal American Jewish values and beliefs. So how do those three claims stand up? How should we look at them today? Well, I think that at the time, back in 2010, uh, the first claim 
that young American Jews uh, were distancing themselves from Israel wasn't at that time an accurate uh, claim. It was at best an exaggeration um, because uh, the uh, Pew uh, survey that came out, carried out by the Pew Research Center a few years later actually indicated back then, this is 2013, um, that most young American Jews, including non-Orthodox, did actually feel an attachment to Israel, albeit less so than older Jews, but that, that was, uh, there was still an attachment to Israel. Uh, and for those who were not attached to Israel, who expressed no attachment, it wasn't really a reflection of uh, politics. It wasn't because of their political alienation. It was rather because they were unattached to Jewish life or uninvolved in Jewish life in general. So it wasn't really specific to Israel. Um, now fast forward, um, now, uh, tw uh, 10 years later, the, the, in, uh, actually in 2020, the Pew Research Center carried out a second major survey of American Jews, and it showed, in fact, lo and behold, that there has been a decline in those years of attachment to Israel by young American Jews. So there has been this, this despite birthright, despite all of the money and efforts poured into try to, trying to sustain that attachment to Israel, we are actually seeing over the, from 2013, a decline from 60% of young American Jews in the 2013 who said they were attached to Israel to now, to 48% in the 2020 survey. And that doesn't talk about um, how they express their attachment. That's just level of emotional connection to Israel. So I think we can see that even though Peter wasn't accurate or at least was exaggerated in 2010 when he described this process of distancing, that there, ha that there is a process of distancing taking place. Um, secondly, what about the claim about this tension between uh, American Jewish liberalism and uh, values and the Israeli reality. I think um, that claim has been borne out. I think uh, particularly in this moment where we see uh, Israel potentially sliding toward uh, a liberal democracy at best, uh, the tension between liberalism, between American Jewish liberalism, and this is something that Noam um, pointed to in the, in the first panel of the day, that for American Jews, um, their commitment to Zionism has always been based upon this belief that it was compatible with their commitment to liberalism. The belief that Zionism uh, was not a, in contradiction to their identity and values as Americans, but in fact was in harmony with it. Um, and I think that belief, that, and that was a belief that was so generative for American Jewish support for Israel, that belief is uh, challenged increasingly, not just by the current judicial overhaul slash coup, whatever you want to call it, um, but also by Israel's ongoing occupation and annexation of the West Bank. And I think the fact, this ten the tension that point Peter pointed to in 2013 between liberalism and contemporary Zionism, I'm not talking about theoretical Zionism, but the actual practice of Zionism, that tension, unfortunately, sadly, has developed into a contradiction today between the two. Um, and that is testing uh, the, the uh, commitment to Zionism for growing numbers of American Jews, and not just younger American Jews, but actually Jews across the political spectrum. The third, uh, the third claim he made um, concerning the, the silence of the American Jewish establishment. Well, I think certainly back in 2010, that was an, act, uh, an apt characterization of the American Jewish establishment, um, of their um, unwillingness to voice any criticism of Israeli government policies publicly. Fast forward to the last few months, we do see a shift, actually. Uh, particularly in response to this judicial coup, uh, there's actually been an outpouring of criticism from the American Jewish establishment, from the Jewish federations, uh, for example, from the ADL, the AJC, even the uh, Orthodox Union uh, criticized publicly, uh, the, at least the speed with which the government was put, pushing through uh, this judicial overhaul. I think where Peter was accurate, and he mentioned uh, was um, in the Conference of Presidents and APAC. So those are the two. APAC and the Conference of Presidents are the two organizations, to my knowledge, that have remained silent 
on the direction on the judicial coup. And what's happening in Israel, whereas, as I said, across the, almost across the board, there has been this outpouring. So I think the fact that even American Jewish establishment organizations, with the exception of two important ones, APAC, although APAC is also uh, mem has many Christian evangelical members, so it's not really a Jewish organization per se, but the Conference of Presidents certainly is. But what we do see is that even the American Jewish establishment is belatedly coming to recognize the threat to liberal Zionism, specifically, to the American Jewish commitment and support for Israel by developments in Israel. I think that's what's driving this outpouring of criticism, is the recognition that it's going to become increasingly hard for not just Jews on the, on the left who care about Palestinians and equality, but for many Jews to identify with Israel if it, if it gives up any semblance of liberal democracy, and if, it, and if the tension between liberalism and Zionism grows to be even more acute than it is today. So I think, in, to conclude, that the uh, article, um, while criticized in 2010, is in many ways, was in many ways a harbinger of things to come, and the analysis is proven to be uh, quite prescient today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dove. An award-winning journalist and historian, Eric Alterman is a CUNY Distinguished Professor of English at Brooklyn College and contributing writer to The Nation and The American Prospect. He is the author of 12 books, including the recently published We Are Not One, A History of America's Fight Over Israel, which The New Yorker called fearless and scrupulous. Uh, and was featured on its list of the best books of 2022. And he received his PhD in US history from Stanford University with a minor in Jewish studies. Thank you. I'm gonna claim, uh, Dove actually went under the seven and a half minutes that were given, so. By about 10 I, seconds. Oh, I was gonna claim, <laughs> I thought it was a minute, I was gonna take it. <laughs> I need it because I need to tell you, number one, that New York is a great place to be Jewish, maybe the best place ever. We have, we have Zabar's, we have Barney Greengrass, and we have the Center for Jewish History, where I've been in the audience many, many times, and I'm, I'm very excited to be on the podium for the first time, so thank you for having me and for all the work that went into this. Um, I also want to talk about what a crappy movie and book Exodus is. <laughs> okay, we'll save that, but it is. It's incredibly crappy. Um, and I want to take just a footnote for a later discussion, uh, Dove. Uh, it was my impression that the new president of the American Jewish Committee, which is a very important group, uh, is very wishy-washy on this. He said, there's some reasons I could see why you might want to change the law. So he, they did not. Other groups have been more full-throated, but I think they are both sizing the issue. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to try and talk as a, like I said, I have strong views, Exodus, New York. But I'm going to try and talk about history as a way of understanding uh, the current crisis and then we can argue later. Um, so the quote that uh, I put up, you can read it. I'm not going to read it. Um, I, I took it because, uh, as a historian, I thought it was really important in terms of the conflict that I see in the history of the discourse between the clergy and the mockers, the, the guys that run the organizations that uh, Dove was talking about, APAC and President's Conference and the AJC and the ADL, et cetera. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, Zionism was very unpopular among American Jews for a very long time. And uh, the first chapter of my book is called Zionism for Thee But Not For Me. Uh, it was, it was a distancing, particularly the German Jews who ran all of the institutions, were very unsympathetic to Zionism. Um, there were a, a series of conferences during World War II where the position of the Jewish community was hammered out eventually in, in favor not only just of Zionism, generally speaking, but in favor of statehood, which actually happened quite late in the debate. Uh, statehood was an extreme position for most of the debate. And, and that debate um, was led by two rabbis, um, Rabbi Wise and Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver. And the AJC, which was, had been since its founding in 1906, the, by far and away the most influential uh, 
representative of Jewish opinion, um, they were they were a washout. They were they were non-Zionist. They did not want anything really, but they they had to go along with what the community supported, and in the community by that by the mid 1940s had become strongly Zionist. And again, it was it was they were they were the caboose. I think they I think they got six votes out of many hundreds of representatives at that at the final meeting where uh, the the, uh, the Zionist position was hammered out. Um, but after the state was founded, the AJC became the interlocutor between the state of Israel and the, and the American Jewish community, much to the fury of the people who had supported the Zionists. They're like, we supported you, and now you're kicking us to the side and going back to the non-Zionists. But that's where the power and the money was. And there were these negotiations between the president of the AJC, Jacob Blaustein, and Ben-Gurion, because Ben-Gurion was always saying, uh, American Jewry is ridiculous. Diaspora Jewry is ridiculous. Everybody needs to come to Israel so you can live an authentic Jewish life. And, and the agency was like, shut up. We're Americans. We don't want you telling our American friends that we're really not uh, loyal Americans. And they, they kept getting Ben-Gurion to make these statements saying, OK, you're Americans. You don't owe us any loyalty. And then he would, the next day, he would go back and say what he said in the first place. Um, but, but with the... the uh, anointment of the HAC by the Israelis and also by the State Department, which liked their non-Zionist position a lot better than they liked the uh, mainstream position of American Jews. Um, uh, and then with the founding of APAC, uh, the organizational life of American Jews became much more important than the rabbis were in terms of being perceived as the voice of the American Jewish community. So Abraham Joshua Heschel was, uh, it was a wonderful photograph, you know? And Mordechai Kaplan was, was also kind of a romantic figure. But the media always went to the uh, heads of the Jewish organizations to get the quotes about what do, what do American Jews think about this? And, um, and they raised a fortune. Uh, and, and they were uh, reinforced over time by neoconservative Jews in the media who had positions that were at odds with the, um, the majority positions of the American Jewish community, particularly when it came to Israel. And yet, the, the heads of these organizations, very hawkish, and the hawkish neocons were perceived to be the voice of the Jews. And uh, there's, this, there's this, it's kind of wonderful and terrible at the same time. Um, in 1972, the uh, Israeli ambassador to the United States was Yitzhak Rabin, and he loved Nixon. And, um, and he wrote a letter to American Jews saying, vote for Nixon. And they're like, oh my god, this is terrible. Number one, it's terrible because we hate Nixon. And number two, it's terrible because what is an Israeli ambassador doing telling American Jews how to vote? And so these rabbis had a meeting with Rabin, and they said, uh, it was Golda Meir, who was prime minister, and said, tell Rabin to stop doing this. And she said, how many phantom jets do you rabbis have? Just like Stalin saying, how many votes, how many troops does the pope have? In any case, I, I got only a minute left, and I haven't even got to my quotes yet. So, so this statement here, as a result of Israel becoming what it is now, rather than the mythical Israel that people understood it to be, is a reckoning uh, with the reality of Israel, or at least a reality of Israel, as perceived by these uh, young cantors and um, rabbis, and cantors and rabbis to be. And, and they, they paid, a, it was a enormously controversial inside that community. I went to a session at the J Street Conference uh, the end of last year, where they were, they, they were talked about how they had lost jobs, and, and one of the speakers was even crying on the podium over the consequences of having signed this statement. Um, the next statement, uh, I'm taking your, his minute, whether he had it or not. Um, and the next statement is a reaction of young Jews, the kind of people that Dov was talking about, that Peter Barnard was talking about, who are also having a similar reaction. Um, this, they were young staffers on the Biden campaign who were horrified. That's my alarm. Um, they were horrified by the reaction of the good Israeli government, the one that preceded Netanyahu's illiberal, theocratic, judicial coup government. So we've come to a moment where uh, Dove said that uh, he thought that uh, 
American Jewish liberalism was always consistent with uh, their Zionism. I would say it was in tension with their Zionism. But now that tension is no longer something that can be ignored. It's at the very forefront of things. And I think David is going to tell you that this is not going to end up mattering in terms of US-Israel relations. And I don't actually disagree with that. But it's certainly going to matter for the future of American Jewry. And that's where I would stop. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And our next speaker, who has already been quoted before speaking. Um, That's not even what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, is David Makovsky, uh, who is the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute and director of the Coret Project on Arab-Israel Relations. He is also an adjunct professor in Middle East Studies at Johns Hopkins University, um, Paul Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, in uh, 2013 to 2014, he worked in the office of the U.S. Secretary of State, serving as a senior advisor to the Special Envoy for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Um, he is co-author of two books with Ambassador Dennis Ross and the host of the Decision Points podcast, which examines Israel, Zionism, and the U.S.-Israel relationship. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Can you hear me in the back okay? Good. I want to thank the Center for Jewish History. It's an honor to be with these distinguished panelists. Uh, it, scrunching everything into seven minutes is gonna be hard and I'm gonna do my level best. Uh, look, I think it's important, first of all, just to zoom out for a second, to look in the big picture, you know, even six, since the 67 war, what I would call the golden triangle the United States, Israel, and American Jewry, and what has been achieved. And I'm sure there's a lot of legitimate critiques uh, you know, since then, but I do think it's important to say a few big things. These three parties, the United States, Israel, and the American Jewish community worked together to do what I would consider to be pretty heroic things. They uh, were able to, to really work together on the Soviet Jewry movement, to get a million Jews, over a million Jews, out of the Soviet Union uh, from different angles. And if people talk about Israel as a startup nation and everything like that, it's in no small measure the fact that Israel benefited from over a million people, many of them who were engineers in the former Soviet Union, and really helped catapult Israel to where it is today, where its GDP per capita has just, according to the World Bank, has just gone ahead of Germany, ahead of Britain, France, uh, Japan. It is a remarkable thing, and I think it's because of this historic partnership between these three parties, the United States, Israel, and American Jewry. Second, they work together, and I'm sure we'll have differences on the panel, but I think the fact that the United States provided aid to Israel uh, during much of this period has contributed to the fact that uh, the, the Arab states have decided the interstate war period had to end. And so you had wars 48, 56, 67, 73, different wars, we can look at 56 differently if you want, I'm happy to have that discussion. But the interstate war period where you had thousands and thousands of people getting killed on the Arab and the Israeli side together, put that together, that ended. Uh, and it's thanks to the fact that the US was so supportive of Israel. Were there mistakes made? Were there ways that could have been different? I am sure that is true if we have the time to discuss that. But I think that this historic golden triangle between these three parties, the US, Israel, and American Jewry, is what has enabled the fact that there have been fewer people dying on battlefields than there were during the first several decades of Israel's existence. Again, not just on the Israeli side, on the Israeli and Arab side. So I think deterrence has had a huge uh, impact. I want to say a word. Uh, I wrote a whole thing, but I, I, I'm worried I'm going to exceed my time. On the judicial uh, overhaul that's going on now. Look, to me, uh, to see the protesters come out on the streets uh, is Israel's gift to itself for its 75th birthday. Uh, the resilience of the people, the secret sauce of Israel for 75 years was the cohesiveness of the public, its ability to have a democracy amid conditions of utter extremists, almost impossible conditions given uh, all the terrorism and the wars that it faced. 
But the resilience of the people tells me one important thing, which I hope would be a source of comfort to this audience, which is Israel's ability to self-correct. Now, I'm not saying it's done. The, the protesters have won. It's over. No, there's twists and turns in this road. There's no doubt. I could go through a lot of polling data with you. Again, no time. But the fact is that instead of like kind of seeing this massive kind of uh, head-on collision between Israel and, and America, or Israel and American Jews, I think the fact is that, uh, that the Israel's ability to self-correct, would any of us have predicted the pilots would refuse to fly to do reserve duty? Would people have predicted that the Prime Minister of Israel uh, would cancel a meeting to American Jewry, right, just last week, because he was afraid of being booed uh, at this context? The point is, is that Israelis have this ability to self-correct, in my view, and I think because it understood that its very character as a Jewish and democratic state is on the chopping block, it hangs in the balance, that is a, should be a source of strong comfort to a belief that here, too, on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, if, if the Israelis have woken up on this issue, they will wake up here, too. I don't think the onus is all on Israel. I speak as someone who worked in the Obama administration and was part of the third effort of the United States to solve this conflict. Clinton tried at Camp David. Condoleezza Rice tried in 2007-8. We tried in 2013 and 14. And believe me, the problem wasn't Israel. It wasn't just Israel, okay? Israel might have made mistakes. I don't think all mistakes were equal. If there's questions from the audience, I could get into this. But the point is, is there's enough blame to go around. And I think the U.S. has tried. Now, some would say, well, what about this fact that American Jews are going to be more young people disillusioned? Uh, I am worried about that. Of course I am. How could you not be? The, the, the twin pillars of the U.S.-Israel relations are shared values, shared interests, and that is something you want to preserve. To believe that Israel can only have shared interests would be like going into a war without an air force. I mean, it's a unilateral disarmament. You want to make sure that you have both of these pillars. And again, I've seen, I've seen the numbers. I've also seen, though, in the United States, the Gallup poll, 68% favorability. And, they, and by the way, uh, they don't see Israel as a white, uh, uh, ethnocentric uh, 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 effort, uh, endeavor. 56% of Israelis call themselves non-Ashkenazic. Um, so a lot of these terms, I think, have been thrown around a little loosely. I think the shared interests will still keep the U.S. and Israeli relationship together because as the U.S. pulls back, retrenches, as the U.S. looks to pivot to China, as we keep hearing about, or as America is more energy independent, focusing on alternative sources of energy, fracking, other things, the net effect is the push on the U.S. to retrench is the same push. In my view, when I go to the Persian Gulf, it's, we, got in, we know that Israel's not going to pull out of the Middle East because Israel lives in the Middle East. We're going to draw closer to Israel. Shared intelligence, shared technology, the digitization of these countries as they look to a post-oil age is going to keep the U.S.-Israel relationship strong in terms of shared interest. Is shared interest sufficient? My answer is no, because you want the shared values. You want as many American Jews as you can. But I just think we need to be a little bit careful here in drawing, in drawing these fears that it's all doomsday ahead. I, I have faith in Israel's ability to self-correct, and I think that there's a lot of these shared values and interests that mean, in my, in my hope, that the U.S.-Israel's best days are still ahead in the next 75 years to come. Thank you all very much. Thank you. There's been a little bit more heckling than I'm used to in my... Um, you need in, to be introduced. Oh, I need to be introduced. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. I was getting really excited about talking about heckling, so I stopped, forgot. That, oh, yeah. um, do you want to first talk about heckling and then I... I'll wait. Okay. I'll wait. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, thank you, David, uh, who spoke for seven minutes and 25 seconds and 47 milliseconds. That was... <laughs> quite impressive. Um, so everyone has been keeping to the seven and a half minutes. If you count the extra minute that Eric took <laughs> from somewhere, um, you might call that a coup or a reform. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, please uh, note 
um, that Dr. Miriam Mora will be uh, coming around as this, um, uh, this symposium continues collecting your questions. Um, so um, instead of or in addition to heckling, kindly send in your questions. Um, okay, Mira uh, Sukarov is professor of political science at Carleton University in Canada. The second Canada reference of the day. Uh, she is the author or editor of five books, including most recently Borders and Belonging, a memoir, uh, and Social Justice and Israel-Palestine Foundational and Contemporary Debates. That was uh, co-edited with uh, Aaron Han Tapper. A member of the Advisory Council of the Jerusalem Declaration on Antisemitism, the Nexus Definition of Antisemitism, and the New Israel Fund of Canada, third time. She is currently developing a podcast with Omar Dejani uh, on the past, present, and future of Jewish and Palestinian life and property in Jaffa, and is co-writing a book also with Omar Dejani uh, on emotional attachment to and legal and political justice in Israel-Palestine. Thank you, Jonathan, and to Gabrielle, and everyone at CJH for hosting this wonderful day. So, heckling. Um, there's been more heckling than I'm used to in, with my delicate uh, sensibilities, so I'll just lay out the uh, ground assumptions on which I work, and if you feel the need to heckle, I invite you to get it over with now. And so the assumptions on which I operate are that Jews deserve individual and collective safety and cultural nurturing in Israel, and of course, um, individual safety everywhere else, of course. And Palestinians deserve individual and collective safety and cultural nurturing in Israel-Palestine. Okay, so um, I wanna talk about discourse. I'm a political scientist, so I'm very presentist, and I really thank, from the bottom of my, of my heart, the historians doing the careful archival work that enables Palestinians and other social scientists, whether we're kind of humanist uh, interpretive or quantitative, to do the kind of work we do. So I'm taking a document from my personal archive of my Facebook um, feed from February 2023. That's as far back as I'm willing to go without getting a little nervous. <laughs> and this was posted publicly, so I, the, ethically I don't mind sharing it because it was posted publicly. And it's between an Israeli a Jew and an American Jew but the Israeli Jew was originally American. Uh, Gershon Baskin made Aliyah in his 20s in 1978. And uh, both are very uh, tied to Israel and both are, very, uh, are both experts on Israel-Palestine dynamics. And it's the Israeli Jew here who's using a Holocaust metaphor to describe what he believes, or he believes that the Holocaust metaphor is an apt way of describing the settler attacks on the Palestinian village of Hawara in February 2023. And it's the American Jew who's pushing back on the Holocaust metaphor. Now, I'm not going to be a good um, political scientist at the moment and make large generalities. Um, I don't have heavy survey data right now to, to bring forth on whether and to what degree uh, different groups in the diaspora or Israel believe that Holocaust or analogies are apt. I do have a little survey data to toss out at you soon in a couple of minutes. But what I will say is that there are different views. There are different views on two questions. One, the applicability of Holocaust analogies to violence in Israel-Palestine. And two, the morality of advancing those kinds of metaphors. Um, and three, three things actually, the strategic advantage or disadvantage to doing that. And so that it's the latter, it's the third thing as to whether it's strategically wise, whether it's prudent, not moral, not accurate, but prudent, to advance these analogies, that's what Paul Sham, who's a professor at University of Maryland, is pushing back on, on his friend and colleague, Gershon Baskin in Israel. So what I wanna think about, I wanna zoom out a little bit on that for a moment, and then I'm gonna bring up two more terms. I wanna zoom out a little bit on that and think about Holocaust trauma as um, perhaps a sine qua non of collective Jewish trauma today, intergenerationally. And it's what we all carry with us, whether we're 
more directly uh, involved with uh, Holocaust loss and survival or more indirectly. Um, in my case, the closest I come is that the grandfather of my children, so my, fa my late father-in-law, was spent a year in the hell of Auschwitz. And so there's a direct link, not genetically myself, but in terms of my own children. And we carry this trauma, and I think it, it creates very different responses. And some of us mobilize uh, collective Jewish historical suffering to stand in solidarity with Palestinians. And some of us mobilize collective Jewish suffering to be very uh, wary of Palestinian tensions and perhaps fearful. And in that spirit, I would like to invite us to consider what the heckling earlier, and I think one of the gentlemen who did the loudest heckling has left, but to consider what is behind that anger. And is it fear or is it um, hatred? And if it is fear, I'm gonna give that gentleman the benefit of the doubt and I'm not gonna call him hateful because I don't know him or her, or I assume it was a him from the tone of voice, but I could be wrong. If it is fear, then let's address that together. And there is no shortage of fear going around in Israel-Palestine. Um, polls that the last polls I saw on this were that Israelis were just as suspicious of Palestinian intentions as Palestinians were suspicious of Israeli intentions. And we have to take fear seriously. Two more terms I want to get, get at. One is, um, three more terms, just because Jeffrey Herf brought up the question of agency. And I used to ask a lot about agency as well. I think it's sort of an exciting term, particularly for a social scientist. And we think about structures and agents, sorry, my own discipline, international relations. That was a big part of our theory, how um, individuals and groups structure the systems around us and how those systems feed back. But now I want to push back respectfully and say, when we ask about agency, are we simply saying responsibility? And if we're asking about responsibility, are we talking about groups or individuals because in international humanitarian law which is something we don't talk enough about in uh, Jewish Zionist circles I don't think I don't believe we do um, the unit of importance is the individual so the unit of importance is the person who lived or the family that lived in the house in Jaffa that's the subject of my podcast who was forced out and yes forced out when Haganah shelled the neighborhood of Ajami in Jaffa in April 48, not May, not middle of May 48 after war, Arab-Israeli interstate war had been declared, but before that. And when peoples live in a neighborhood that's being shelled, the um, obvious response to save your life is to leave. And so in the course of two weeks in April, 68,000 Palestinians out of 70,000 Almost all the Palestinians emptied out into the sea. And so when my mom the other day on a call with me said, well, don't the Arabs want to push us into the sea? I said, well, that is literally, and I'm using literally in a Gen X way, not in a millennial or Gen Y way where they use it in the reverse. It is literally what um, pre-Israeli militias, forces, Haganah, did to Palestinians. Okay, third, apartheid. I'm not going to tell you whether I think Israel's an apartheid state or not, but I will tell you something about fear and community shunning. When I appeared on a panel discussing Human Rights Watch's report, which declared Israel's occupation to be akin to apartheid, I appeared on a panel about that. I didn't say what I was going to say. It was just my name was on the, on the flyer. One of my family members called another family member one ant called another ant. Okay, let's just be honest. And the result has been official shunning, such that I no longer am able to visit the aunt and uncle I grew up spending so much time with in Israel, my Israeli aunt and uncle. I visit Israel a lot. My aunt just had her 80th birthday. I wasn't invited. I would have gone. Um, so it's very painful. And so I'm going to assume that my aunt is fearful, and that is what is going on. And the word apartheid is very fear generating because no one wants to see themselves as, as being part of an apartheid system. Now, is Israel or is Israel not an apartheid state? I will leave you with one thought, and that is if you want to know whether it is or isn't, go to the International Criminal Court, Google Rome Statute 2002, read the definition, and you decide. And, and wait, sorry, I don't mean, that wasn't meant to be um, rhetorical, like you decide and the answer better be yes. I literally, sorry, literally mean look for definitions that are out there and then decide with our own heads what fits or what doesn't, and those are legitimate debates to have. That is genuinely what I meant, because I didn't want to leave it on a, on a, what's the word, note where you're... <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Hello, is this on now? Can you hear me? Yes? Good. Okay, um, thank you so much. We have some questions that have come in from the audience, but before we get to those, um, I want to pose a few questions to um, the members of the panel, and um, you should each feel free to answer the question that I'm posing um, to you, if, if it's directed to you, but also to respond to those of, um, answers that you hear. So this should become a conversation. Um, Dove, you uh, tell us that uh, Peter Beinart got it right. Um, he wasn't necessarily right when he wrote it, but he became right thereafter. Um, I'm wondering if there are any areas of Peter Beinart's uh, observations about um, about American Jewish connections to Israel that you think he got wrong. Um, so that's um, for Dove. Um, you say, uh, Eric, that um, you don't think that Cantor's and rabbinical students um, matter in the sense that you suspected David would say, and you, you in advance agreed with him, and I'm wondering why not? Um, uh, rabbis and cantors seem very important in American Jewish life, so why, um, why don't you think they matter? Um, David, it, you um, sort of anticipate some of the questions that I had for you, but, but um, Basically, you, you tell us that, that things are pretty secure uh, in the uh, U.S.-Israel relationship um, because of this triangle, right? The U.S., Israel, um, and American Jewry. Um, but you also acknowledge the weakening of, uh, of one leg of that triangle of American Jewry in, in, in this relationship. Um, and so I'm wondering just, you know, you say you are a little bit worried. Can you, can you spell that out? What are you worried about? Um, what do you think could happen if um, if what Dove is telling us is happening, uh, continues, progresses, um, what, what, what should we be worried about? Um, or what are you worried about? Um, and um, Mira, I, I'm wondering if you could, um, some of the questions that, that came in, I think, are related to some of the fears that you um, uh, are discussing um, with us. Uh, the questions, a lot of them are, are about college campuses. Um, and I'm wondering, um, to what extent you see uh, the fear of American or Canadian Jewry um, about the future of their community uh, playing out in the fears that they have and anxieties they have expressed um, about what their children are being taught on campus? Okay, so uh, we'll start with Dove. Yeah. Can we go back to the original? Oh, yes, yes, we can. Okay, so. Um in terms of what he got wrong, uh, well, as I said, first of all, I think his, his uh, general um, depiction of distancing as being driven by politics as opposed to more uh, assimilation, if you like, was is fundamentally wrong. Both it was exaggerated, but also in the role of policy. I think where he was right is in talking about a subsection of young non-Orthodox American Jews who are highly engaged, the, uh, the, the authors of the letter that uh, Eric uh, showed, who are very engaged in Jewish life, that's a, a smaller section, but I don't think... Oh, sorry, I thought I put um, I don't think that was true of young American Jews in general. But I think... I'm going to read the... the I'm going to read the last line of that quote uh, that I selected from... Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, Do you want the second page of this? Yeah. Okay, so saving liberal Zionism in the United States so that American Jews can help save liberal Zionism in Israel is the great American Jewish challenges of, challenge of our age. I think he's got that wrong. And I think he got it wrong because American Jews can't save liberal Zionism in the United States if there's no liberal Zionism in Israel. Liberal Zion, the future of liberal Zionism in the United States depends upon its existence it's flourishing in Israel. The idea that American Jews can sustain a liberal Zionism here and then export it to the United States, I think is a, it, I mean, it's a, it's a self-comforting illusion, um, which I think in one hand uh, misunderstands what, what sustains liberal Zionism, which, as I said, is ultimately whether the practice of Zionism is liberal. If the practice of Zionism isn't liberal, liberal Zionism cannot succeed or last. And I think the practice of Zionism is what we have to pay attention to today, not the, the theory of Zionism or theories of Zionism. And second of all, I think it, uh, um, it overstates the degree to which, sadly, uh, Jewish Americans have an influence on dynamics in Israel. Even if, even if we were able, 
here in the United States to somehow sustain liberal Zionism by basically pretending that the Zionism in Israel doesn't exist and we kind of create a bubble around liberal Zionism in the United States, I don't think that is likely to influence the, the, the trajectory of Zionism in Israel itself. I, so I think the process of influence is not, in, in short, from the United States to Israel, but from Israel to the United States. And ultimately, the more illiberal uh, Zionism becomes in Israel, the more illiberal it will become in the United States, and the more that will drive liberal American Jews away from their identification with Zionism. Eric? Do you want to either respond to that or respond to my question? Um, I think my response to your question <coughs> speaks also to Dove's answer. Um, yeah, so I hope I didn't say what you think I said which is that rabbis and cantors, particularly young rabbis and cantors, don't matter. Of course they matter uh, to their communities, to their future communities, to the future of the Jewish people, and particularly the American Jewish people. Where they haven't mattered historically is since the takeover of the American Jewish discourse by American Jewish legacy organizations like APAC and the President's Conference and the American Jewish Congress and the ADL, and neoconservative pundits who are seen as speaking for Jews in the media. Um, what's happening now is uh, two things. One is, is that the mythical Exodus version of Israel that has been put forth by these organizations, historically speaking, and the neoconservative pundits, and on some panels, is collapsing. It's no longer supportable. It does not fit an Israel that has pogroms, an Israel that uh, had more, that under its nice government killed more Palestinians in the year uh, before this than had been killed under Netanyahu. That, I mean, it's just, it's a terrible situation, whatever you want to call it, it's a terrible situation to be a Palestinian living under occupation in the West Bank. And it's a terrible situation for most Palestinian Israelis living inside Israel under discrimination. Again, whatever you want to call it. Israel has had five elections in a row where peace has not even been an issue that was discussed. So, so the, in the past, if one said, if one said, if, if one was critical of Israel, one would be attacked as an anti-Semite and would be divorced from the discourse. Now, as I say in the, in the book, which you should all read, it's great, um, <laughs> the call is coming from inside the house, okay? That's my point. It's coming from the future rabbis and cantors. It's coming from the Jewish staffers who identify as Jews and work for Biden. And I don't think it's going to have much effect on U.S.-Israel relations. I don't think the Israelis really care at all. Netanyahu and, and his previous ambassador said, we don't need American Jews. We have the conservative Christians and the Republican Party. But it matters for American Jews. Historically speaking, certainly since 1967, Zionism has been at the very center of American Jewish both individual and collective identity. That no longer works. The, 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 the Zion is not the Zion of our imagination, of the Zion that, I'm sorry, most of the people in this room are of the generation that learned about it, as I am. Um, it's, a, it's a very different place. It, it's not, it does not sustain American Jewish identity which is one important reason, not the only reason, but one important reason why conservative Jews have lost 33% of their uh, membership. Reformed, Jew, Reformed Jews has, have lost about 20% of their membership all in the past 15 years. And young American Jews are more alienated from Judaism, not just from Israel, but from Judaism, than their grandparents or parents ha have, have ever been. So that's to me, that, that to me is the crisis that I think American Jews can do something about. About Israel, Israel doesn't care. Israel got a $38 billion advance from Barack Obama, who's supposedly anti-Israel on the idea in the, in the notion. $38 billion over 10 years. This is the last thing I'll say. I'm sorry, I'm talking too long. But so in 2021, they used up a billion dollars uh, with the Iron Dome, shooting down missiles that came from uh, Gaza. So, so Congress had a vote on whether or not to give them another billion, because they actually had to use a billion of the 38 billion that they were getting. You know what the vote was? It was, 500, it was 529 to eight, with one abstention. 
AOC was the abstention. So that's the crisis that Israel faces. They're, all, they're getting eight votes against them instead of two votes against them um, out of 538. That's not a crisis they need to worry about. But the fact that most American Jews disagree with the policies of the United States and want, want, want strict conditions put on Israeli aid, uh, human rights related conditions, and there's no place for them to be represented democratically in that system as Jews, that's the problem we face because they're just going to walk away from Judaism entirely, and that's what's happening. Okay. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I guess where I would respectfully differ on some of this is I see a lot more gray in this picture than black and white. Um, I, what, what, you know, what worries me? Uh, what worries me is what I think what, uh, you know, what, you know, Mr. Alterman just said is I agree with, and that maybe that's what, that shouldn't worry me, but that maybe some of this alienation is not always about Israel. Maybe it's about also an alienation from Judaism, according to all these polling data that we're seeing. And maybe we're not reading into that enough. Look, also the sense of peoplehood that was so dominant in the Soviet Jewry movement that I mentioned in the 80s. You could say that was a great unifying cause. Uh, do we have that same sense of peoplehood today? That doesn't mean Israel right or wrong. I want to be very clear about that. But the peoplehood that I think really was so consequential in the past, I don't know for many people uh, if that is as central as, as it is today. I am certainly concerned if, if uh, more young liberal Jews are, don't feel that sense of identification. I think it's tragic and it's not all you know, uh, their fault, obviously. I agree with what Dove said, that uh, if there's not a, 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 a liberal Zionism out of Israel, that, that's gonna have implications here. I just feel that, and maybe you tell David you're too optimistic. Uh, I mean, I look at all the polls, I see how the Likud is just crashing uh, because of its identification with Smotrich and Ben Gvir. There's an, um, you know, there's an, they have basically, you know, they've overdone it in a way that's gonna create a backlash. And we're seeing that in the streets of Tel Aviv and in other parts of the country that people don't want that kind of government. Uh, they like the idea of more, you know, if this was a football field, it would go from like center right to center left. There could be a pilot, but they'd have to navigate to, between a wing to his right and a wing to his left because the world is a very messy place and they don't lend, doesn't always lend itself to very neat categories in the, you know, sorry for my mixed metaphors, of, of the end zones of, 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 the, of any football field, left end zone, right end zone. It's often messier. And frankly, you know, as someone who goes to Ramallah, usually about three times a year, to visit uh, Palestinian counterparts, you know, I find in talking to them, they don't say it publicly, but they say it privately. They go, look, this is not all on Israel. Are you kidding me? This is on us. Uh, we have corruption. We have governance issues. We gotta get our act together. And I don't think we're doing anybody any favors. Uh, as, a, as a one senior Palestinian put it to me, he goes, the American Jews are not helping us if they're putting all the blame on the Israelis. It's just not true, and it doesn't help us. We have to be accountable to ourselves. And look, the United States tried to hit the home run ball three times, like I said. Clinton, Condi's effort, our effort in the Obama years. And like I said, there was enough blame to go around. I don't, wanna, I don't see everything as doom and gloom. I see self-correction on the Israeli side. It is way overdone it uh, with the smotrich ben Gvir thing, and I think there's a backlash to that. And I think Palestinians privately, when I sit with them in the West Bank, they feel the same, that there's gotta be accountability from within. So my view is we can't afford to give up. We don't have the luxury to give up uh, and talk about this in the, in the past. We're not gonna solve 1948, in my view. We just won't. All we could do is try to solve the future. We can't solve the past. And to solve the future means we have to keep at it. We've got to try to have dignity for all sides, but we don't do anybody any favors by, by painting everything in a very dark brush. Thank you very much. Thanks. A few things. I'll, I will get to the question, and I just wanted to do a couple of little responses to David. Um, uh, 
you talked earlier about the um, the protests against the judicial overhaul, and I just wanted to say that in my view, if uh, the status quo ante is brought about, or if the status quo is maintained of a squ sort of, of the democratic system as it is, or the judicial system as it is, I do not believe, with my political science hat on, that that is true democracy in light of how Omer Bartov pointed out that half a million, half of pal half of the people under Israel's rule are not, um, do not have rights, okay? So that's one thing on that. And then there was another thing I wanted to, to get, get, get in there on, but now I've forgotten, so, so we'll do it later. Um, Kat, pardon? Pardon? He never said that. Who didn't? Professor Bartov. Citizens. Yes, so if you take everyone from the river to the sea, half are Palestinians, and of that, 20% have more rights than the remainder do. Oh, if we could please um, okay. just thank allow... You for, thank you for clarifying, thank you for clarifying. Okay, um, but they do not all have, they have different levels, different gradations of rights, but if we're talking about tr true democracy, we don't have gradations of rights, I think that's the point. Okay, campus. Um, the question was phrased in terms of what students are learning. I'm going to um, punt it a little bit, I mean I'll address a little bit what students are learning, but really I can only tell you what they're learning in my course, and I can make assumptions about what they're learning in other courses, but I'm going to pivot and talk about the broader campus climate. In terms of courses, I don't think you have to worry. Professors love teaching material that they don't agree with. My favorite day is teaching the Ari Shavit piece in The New Yorker. I love teaching that piece because he just hands it to me on a silver platter. He says, would he do it all over again? Would he ethnic cleanse Lira all over again? And he says, yes, I would. The question's phrased differently, so the answer is no, but he means yes, I would, because he says, would I not want to do it again? No, but that's my point. I love teaching that piece because it excites me that the, that a point of view is being so transparently shown. I love teaching Danny Diane's op-eds in the, in the New York Times, a former uh, settler leader. I love teaching um, uh, far left campus debates. I love giving students the range of discourse so they can wrestle with it. And by the way, if a student hands in a paper, even if the um, professor agrees with it, professors are, we are hardwired to make sure students defend, provide sources and defend their arguments. So I don't think, even if they agree with it, they're not going to give it a pass, just give it a free pass. So I don't think you have to worry about classrooms. Campus politics. That I think there is a problem. And this is where, where I see the problem is. People, and even today, how many times can we, would, can we do one of those Google searches for how many times the word Zionism was used today? I know that was more about Google books. How many times was the word Zionism used today, and how many times was it defined? Maybe between zero and one times. So I'm going to just close my, probably my remarks, by telling you very briefly about a survey I conducted and created for American Jews in 2021. I think the results came out. I asked American Jews, are you a Zionist? Good solid majority said yes, 58%. And then I said, I'm now going to provide a definition of Zionism. Are you a Zionist? I said, Zionism means the belief in a Jewish and democratic state. Are you a Zionist? About 72% said yes. So even more said yes. They like that kind of simple definition. Then I said, are you a Zionist if I say that Zionism means an emotional attachment to Israel? About the same number, 72%. Then I asked another question, and this is what Omer Bartov, sorry, we're ki kissing cousins today, I guess that's not the appropriate term anymore, whatever. Uh, we're not supposed to say fellow travelers because that's considered very, very self-hating, um, but we're whatever. We're on, we're, we're thinking similarly, and what I want to say is the definite, I didn't say this in the survey, but I'm telling you, the way I got this final definition is basically how Palestinians have experienced Zionism since its inception till now. And the, the definition I gave, I didn't use the word Palestinian, I just said the following. Are you a Zionist if Zionism means a system of governance that prioritizes Jews over non-Jews in the state of Israel? A state-led system of governance. How many of those American Jews said they were Zionist then? Only 10%. So, migrate this over to campus discourse. You have 18, 19, 20-year-olds who don't, who haven't taken my survey necessarily, maybe some of them have, 
Uh, no, I think you had to be 18 and up, so they wouldn't have, if they're freshmen, they wouldn't have. Um, they haven't thought about Zionism necessarily in all these types of definitions. They haven't read the Zionist idea necessarily. They don't know all the different streams of Zionism. They're using the word Zionist in a certain way. And opponents of Zionism are using it in a very different way. We need better campus discourse that allows people to talk about what you really mean. And at the same time, to acknowledge that the way we are raising our Jewish kids in our institutions from Jewish day school to Jewish day camp to synagogues, except for a very, very, very few exceptions in synagogues, some that are pushing back on Zionism, the main way we are raising our Jewish kids is to think about Zionism as an extension of Jewish identity. Of course, when they arrive on campus, never mind the whole thing, lies you told me about Israel, just in terms of an extension of your identity and your, all of a sudden your identity is being challenged. And I, I feel for those kids, but I also realize that we have to talk about policies. Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much, Mira. Dove had a, um, a comment as well. A comment, and uh, yeah, I want to respond uh, and ask David a question. So, first of all, just to pick up on where Mira left off about Zionism, um, I think it is instructive that, um, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to a Pew survey, the Pew survey of Israeli Jews in which 60% said they believed that Jews should have preferential rights in Israel. Um, and so that indicates... And young people even higher. And young people even higher. So this was actually leads me to the question that I have for David. I don't want to paint a, 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 a just a gloomy and dark picture, but I think, you know, as analysts, we look at trends, right? And we extrapolate from current trends. And one of the clear things in Israel, if you look at the survey data, is that there is a close correlation between religiosity and political affiliation. Basically, the more religious you are, the more right-wing you tend to be, right? That is, that is kind of like the golden rule of Israeli polling, okay? So what, and, and clearly we know that demographics, again, caveat, demographics aren't destiny, things might change, but right now, demographics point to a growing religious population among Israeli Jews, which indicates that they are politically likely to be a right wing, given the connection between religiosity and political orientation. So if we take those two trends, where Israel is politically today, where the majority of Israeli Jews today identify as on the right, and as I said, I just gave you that data point that 60% believe preferential rights for Jews in Israel, given the demographics of the situation, that points clearly to the fact that Israel is moving in a direction that is increasingly likely to be more religious and right wing, American Jews, the majority, not the orthodox minority, but the majority are moving in the opposite direction, becoming more secular and more liberal. Young American Jews are more liberal, young non-orthodox are more liberal than older non-orthodox. So while we might want to you know, talk about all the bromides about how nice this relationship was in the past, the reality is that the rift, which is is, is, is evident, is likely to grow in the future. And I think, while we don't, I don't want to say, obviously, things can change, but I think acknowledging the, the trends and what underlies that isn't just, you know, scares, but, but real, real data. So I just wanted to know how you can remain optimistic yeah. given that demographic and political okay. trend. Can, can I just, uh, but before sure. you answer, David, may I just um, remind us that um, there are demographic trends that are in Israel, which you've noted, but there are also demographic trends in the United States. In other words, the demographics here are not static either, and uh, the birth rates are different among the different groups within the Jewish community. And so one has to remember that the American Jewish community is changing as well. So I would say, my, my, in looking to the future, that we're going to see Israel is increasingly a religious and right wing project that, that is both a right wing. Polit uh, 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 people on the right, whether they're Jewish or non-Jewish, and people who are religious, whether they're Jewish or non-Jewish. So Orthodox Jews and Evangelical Christians will, will remain, and they are becoming the key constituencies, as we've seen, whereas the more secular, that is, in other words, the division isn't between American Jews and Israel, but a growing divide between secular liberals on one side who are moving away uh, from supporting Israel, or at least supporting the, Israeli, the state of Israel, and religious conservatives who are increasingly embracing it? No, I think it, it's a very good question. Um, so thank you for that. I, um, I think a lot about the demography as destiny issue a lot. And uh, I've said in, in my other talks that I think when people talk about the judicial overhaul, that is really in a certain way the demography as destiny is the kind of mega question behind it. Beyond the, the, the issue of the role of the Supreme Court, 
is a question of secular Israelis, are they living on borrowed time? In other words, let's assume for now that they have won 2023. Netanyahu, for his own reason, can't announce that to his base, but all the, all the vectors are, are moving in that direction. If I'm, you know, you don't have to be secular, but as someone who wants Israel to remain a liberal democracy, to me, that's not enough. You know, you need a supermajority that ensures that you can't change the rules of the game unilaterally uh, in the future. Now, I'm a bit dubious that Israel's going to be able to put together a constitution for the same reason why it hasn't had a constitution since 1948, because the religion and state issues are so dominant. But I do think the issue of a supermajority is something that is attainable, where you can't change the rules of the game. Uh, just like if you were going to Yankee Stadium or wherever you're going in New York, and one side wants to play baseball, and the other side says, no, I want to play football. I mean, the rules of the game are something that both sides have to agree to. So I do think the issue of demography as destiny is a very fair point, and that to me makes it so much more important <laughs> that, the, that the judicial uh, overhaul issue is addressed squarely with a supermajority so people don't feel, well, of course now, the Haredim are just waiting for 10 years when the numbers shift. You know, so I think that that, to me, is the bigger question. Obviously, I, I care about Israel as a liberal democracy, but it's not enough that it wins now. It's got to, it, it has to stay. So that's point one. Point, point two, now, how does that play out policy-wise? I would just say, look, in the real world, and I just see it as someone, uh, you know, as a policy analyst, you know, people can have their druthers, but w what this government shows me is, what happens when all you know, the trains go off, off the tracks? And that, in fact, uh, there are a lot of other issues that are not just about what is a Haredi guy in Mea Sharim or in Harnof or a settler in Bet El or an Ofra think, all right? To me, there's other very important constraints that go the other way, which is how does Israel going to deal in the, in the Middle East? How's it going to deal with the United States, which is its biggest weapons supplier? I mean, there's so many different, you know, counter examples, in my view, that I feel that people should not extrapolate the democracy as destiny, demography as destiny issue, um, you know, and just say it's all black, it's all doom and gloom. Because I think in the real world, the security service, I mean, there's so many different players here. And I just, again, I, you could say I'm, I'm too hopeful, but I feel that Israel being aroused the way it's being aroused in these last 17 weeks is so outstanding, so spectacular, that I think once you're aroused to protect the identity of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, that, that arousal is going to continue about the next hilltop, which is the Palestinians. So I, I do believe in this self-correction, and I do believe there's a hundred other countervailing considerations that policymakers have to make, and it's not just about how many children are born in Harnof. Okay, um, thank you. So we have just a few minutes left, and I want to pose um, a sort of bigger question to uh, our panelists um, for you to sort of take in whatever direction you wish, and in this case, we'll, we'll start with Mira, if it's okay, and, and, and move back so that uh, we're sure that Mira has the time. Um, and that is, uh, you know, the, the, the topic of this uh, panel is Zionism's future wither Israel diaspora relations. And I'm wondering if um, we are here in 10 years um, and are reflecting back on the, uh, the previous decade, um, what are the sorts of things that you think we're going to uh, be remarking on? Where is the relationship between Israel and the American Jewish diaspora, or North American Jewish diaspora, if you prefer, Mira, uh, um, going? I don't mind checking my Canadian identity at the door for the day. I also love New York, and I want to make Aliyah here. Um, uh, I think we'll, if we're here in 10 years, um, we will be saying two things. We will be looking back at the protests that David's been referring to in Israel, and some of us will be saying, um, thank goodness that Israel restored its uh, judicial system to the way it was, and others will be saying it's a real shame to have missed an anti-occupation opportunity. 
In other words, the self-correction that you're referring to is it within very, I think, very narrow bounds. And um, I think that there's a much broader conversation about democracy to be had. And maybe that is a subsequent topic for a Center for Jewish History Symposium is what do we really mean by democracy? And indeed there will be one, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, David, if you oh, the same question. Yeah, if, if if you don't mind. Well, I because I'm I'm clearly the optimist uh, here on this panel. I mean, I look at just the way the Haredim in the last month have reacted. Okay, I look at the fact that they refused to co-sponsor the right-wing demonstrations. Okay, which maybe would shock many of the people in this audience, but I think their leaders uh, have no basic math. 20% of the people pay 80% of the taxes in Israel. They are completely dependent on the largesse of the state. If the secular Israelis leave the country, you know, who is going to provide them with their welfare subsidies? Uh, their poverty rate has been 58%, now it's 54. And I don't know if it's dropped to 44 because the, the largesse has gone up. The national poverty rate is 22%, and that includes Israeli Arabs as well. Um, and so I see more savviness here that uh, they know that it doesn't, it, there's not a, a calculation point, a tipping point of 51, 49. I mean, look, in, in, let's say the Haredim are 13% now. Uh, and maybe in 2060, they're, they're, I'm told they're going to be 33% according to these things. But I don't think it waits till then. I think it's, you know, it's going to be much sooner. By the way, I'm not picking on the Haredim. I know that the critique is about the religious Zionist public writ large, not just Haredim, of course, who don't even call themselves religious Zionists, I should say. But I do think that once secular Israelis feel they're not at home, um, you know, that this is going to be an earthquake. Look, there are things like the Moody's upgrade. I watch Israeli news every night in Hebrew, okay, in real time, 1 p.m., in, in Washington, uh, 8 p.m. in Israel. Israelis are having an amazing education about Moody's, Fitch's, uh, all these S&P 500, Maza S&P, Maza S&P. Okay, well, S&P is that if people don't think this is a liberal democracy, you know, they can put their money elsewhere. The shekel to dollar ratio, all these things are the lead stories. These people didn't even, shekel to dollar they knew. But Fitch's, Moody's, and S&P, they did know. And a lot of this is, home generated. It's not coming from the outside in. It's coming also from Israelis in the high tech sphere who have other options. So I see this, I guess the difference between me and the other, some of the other panelists is I see this as much more fluid. I don't see it as set in stone. I see a lot of countervailing uh, uh, considerations here. And I, and I, and I take inspiration, I, I use that word, from the Democratic protesters 17 weeks in a row who are self-correcting. And I feel that if democracy will be at stake, if this is a permanent, uh, permanent thing. I know it's gone on for a long time, but I also know there have been a lot of peace processes where the US has invested everything and, and the offers have been excellent. And, and the Palestinians have also messed this up. And I know this firsthand because I've seen it from the inside. So I don't see it again as doom and gloom, and I, and I count on the Israeli self-correct. If a lot of liberal Jews are lost, for me, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. There's nothing short of a tragedy. But I don't see it there yet. I see the trends as not great. I do think the shared uh, uh, interests will keep the U.S.-Israel relationship strong as broader U.S. support remains strong. But to me, that's not enough. You're not going to get me to say, David's hoping and counting on the evangelicals. No, that's not me at all. And I, I think you need to keep the twin pillars. And Israel would be suicidal to self-disarm this way by saying all we need is shared interests. No, not enough. Not enough for the U.S.-Israel relationship. What, what motivated Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, Joe Biden, uh, put in George W. Bush, was also shared values. And I think Biden's reaction about not wanting to have Netanyahu come is because he saw that as, hey, we're two sister democracies based on uh, a, a commitment to the rule of law and an independent judiciary. So I, I haven't given up. Maybe in 10 years, we'd have the same discussion. I will think differently, but I see the issue as far more fluid, and I don't, I don't think we have the luxury to give up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is this working now? Yeah, okay. Um, 
I mean, there is, whoa, working a little too well. Uh, um, I, I would, just before I hand it over to Eric, I would just say, like, there's some irony, um, but also uh, something very nice about the fact that the person here who has spent uh, his time working on um, bringing uh, Arab-Israeli peace is the optimist here, so that's great. <laughs> Not surprised, you. Um, I'm a little confused because I can be the skunk at any garden party I go to, but this garden party, like, I don't know which skunk to be because there's conflicting views that I disagree with. Uh, anyway, look, um, I agree that the Palestinians have a lot to answer for uh, since the 1920s in terms of their inability to seize opportunities, many of which only look good in retrospect. They definitely should have cooperated with the UN Commission in 1947 instead of doing what they did. Even though they've been offered raw deals every single time, they should have taken them because it's better than what they have now. But you know, we've talked very little about the Palestinians today. Um, they're 20% of the population inside the Green Line, and they're slightly more than the Jewish population from the river to the sea. And, uh, and those people, if you put yourself in their place, they would never, ex you would never accept what we're, not only asking them to accept, we're just basically ignoring their position. I mean, the IDF, I have a memo that the IDF took credit for expelling 700,000 people before, before May 1948. Okay, and then that property that of those people that were expelled was expropriated by the state and given to the Jewish Agency, which which owns 93 percent of the land in Israel and does not give it to the Palestinians. Everything about Palestinian life inside or outside the Green Line is discriminatory. I'm not going to give it a name, but it's not something that any any of us would accept. And yet we're talking about it as if it's not even important. Talking about going to the status quo ante. There's no status quo ante for the Palestinians in, in, in that. And, and by the way, David, none of this has happened, what you're saying. It's, you're saying, oh, thank God that we're having these demonstrations and, and it's not going to happen. Netanyahu hasn't given an inch. He has, he, he, he has, and he's going to go to jail if he doesn't, if he does. So he's not going to give an inch. I disagree. I'm not at all optimistic. It's wonderful to see all these people rising up. But A, they're not rising up for the 20% of the people in their country that have no rights. And B, they haven't won anything yet. So I actually am totally cool. And I didn't, I didn't begin this way until I, I dug into my research and wrote this book. I am actually total, totally cool now with the divorce between American Jews and Israel. And here's why. Even if you agree that everything Israel does is absolutely justified and absolutely right, it's a very different country than the one we live in here. It's a, it's a little country surrounded by hostile states in the Middle East thousands of miles away. Living through Israel as a vicarious experience has been very unhealthy for American Jewry, and that's one reason I think that it's in crisis. I think this is an opportunity now that we know that the, the, the shared values in this equation are between Trump and Netanyahu, they're not between me and the Israeli public, um, that n this is an opportunity for American Jews who, who have observed the Zionization of their identities to go back and say, what does it mean to be a diaspora Jew? What can I offer my children and my grandchildren other than this uh, vicarious experience <coughs> that is increasingly not credible and not meaningful to them? And that's, and that's, that's my idea of optimism anyway in this discussion. So thank you. Okay, um, so I'm gonna try and maybe uh, in the spirit of uh, the person who convened us all today, Gabrielle, I wanna present two alternative histories that we'll look back on. One is the history of this moment, as David outlined, this, this uprising of secular Israelis, this, this, the, the center finding its voice, leads to the collapse of the current far-right government. It leads to a new uh, center-left government with Prime Minister Yair Lapid, including Graham Tal, maybe even the joint list, the formation for the first time of a genuine Arab-Jewish uh, coalition government in Israel, um, and that, in turn, takes um, the, 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 this current moment of democracy and recognizes that actually the future of Israeli democracy does depend upon having democracy for Palestinians as well. And before a Palestinian authority collapses altogether and disappears into civil war, takes this last opportunity to somehow, some miraculously achieve 
um, some kind of political solution. I'm not going to, you know, not necessarily a traditional two-state system, but we will look back on this moment as that turning point where Israel turned toward uh, the toward uh, a more liberal, optimistic, hopeful future. That's option. That's one alternative scenario. The other scenario is the concurrent trend, which sadly I think is the more likely trend, which is that uh, whatever the outcome of this current, uh, of the judicial overhaul, um, the right wing uh, continues to gain power and entrench power in Israel. There is a gradual ongoing slow exodus of more secular Israelis who have the ability to get second passports, leaving young, uh, young liberals in the diaspora increasingly turn away, um, and Israel becomes an increasingly ethnocratic and less democratic uh, country, which uh, creates a situation where many young Jews, and Jews in general, feel no, they can no longer identify with this country. Um, and there's an increasing deep split uh, within the Jewish community between those who do, uh, between kind of Jewish nationalists who retain their Zionism and Jewish liberals who have abandoned their nationalism. Um, that's the two alternative futures. I agree, it, it's not set in stone. We here, although we only have a very, very small role to play in deciding that future, we all have some role to play in deciding which of those two futures is possible. So I'd leave it on that hopeful note. Neither is, neither is set in stone, but those I think are the two scen alternative scenarios we might look back on. Thank you very much for this panel. Um, I hope you all leave here knowing exactly what to expect in the next 10 years. Um, and I hope that you all enjoyed your day today. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to one and all for being here. Look, I wanted to, um, I'll keep it short because I know we have a wine and cheese reception to go to, to which everyone's cordially invited. I want to begin by thanking all the panelists from panel five, plus all the panelists from panels one through four. Please join me in thanking them. Second of all, all I can do is say that um, it's to your credit that you're here all day, you're listening, you're doing a little heckling, but also maybe a little learning, and the fact that in a very polarized uh, society such as we live in <clears throat> today, we actually can hear a wide range, a truly wide range of views. I think that's to our credit uh, as a collective, but also it's something that the Center for Jewish History has always strived to be, a big tent that allows all elements and all varieties of perspective to come together and to ask questions. Whether or not we get answers, it's a whole separate matter, but that's uh, the second point. Number three, um, I uh, have already indicated there will be an opportunity to uh, talk with one another, talk to some of our panelists uh, over some refreshments. Uh, and last but not least, on June 7th, if you're interested in more uh, high-end events at the Center for Jewish History, we're going to be having our annual gala uh, featuring the eminent German-Jewish historian Michael Meyer, uh, and we'll be celebrating his scholarship, his achievements, as well as that of former fellows. And on June 7th, uh, should you be interested in coming by the center, you can go online and see what uh, the details look like. Otherwise, many, many thanks again to everybody, and I'll see you outside.